So hello and welcome to the tutorial backward scheduling. The tutorial includes a short introduction into the theory of backward scheduling. And then I would like to introduce how you can implement backward scheduling into discrete event simulation based on the software and logic. The theory is straight forward and I hope very easy. So we have one order which consists of two processing steps. And the order has a due date given by the customer. And now um, we need to find an appropriate starting date uh, for releasing this order into production to satisfy the due date. So that means we know we have two processing steps here and we also have included a safety time. You can of course neglect that safety time and just include that in the plant lead time. So what we are doing here in backward scheduling, once the order has been stated by the customer, we deduct the plant lead time to identify a starting date. And when this order has reached the starting date, we immediately release it to production. Then the two processes are executed and then for some reason, uh, we have also introduced some safety time. Now the question is how to define the plant lead time to satisfy the due date. Yeah? So you could also um, adjust the plant lead time to short. Perhaps it is satisfied or st should start here. Yeah? Then perhaps you have then the troubles not being on time. So for the backward scheduling itself, we just have one planning parameter, which is the plant lead time. And here it is necessary to define um, this planned lead time in such a manner that you can meet the customer required due date. The backward scheduling is also used for the MRP approach. Yeah? So I'm visualizing here um, the hierarchical planning um, introduced by Hobbs Berman in the factory physics book. So we have here the long term planning, the medium term planning, and the short term planning. And we have here a production planning method MRP2. And in MRP2, also the backward scheduling is executed. In the MRP itself, the first step is the netting, the second step is the lot sizing, and then we have the shift to identify the starting date for this production order, which is done by the backward scheduling. And the final step is then the bill of material explosion. So this is an example where backward scheduling is used. But we can also see, especially in small sized company, that they do not have an MRP, so that they just release the production orders based on custom orders by deducting a plant lead time. And that leads me to the last slide, to the implementation in Analogic. So welcome to Analogic. So this is my simple model. I have the custom orders which are triggered by an exponential distributed into rifle time. So I'm using the rate. In Analogic, the rate is exponential distributed. And then we um, have a specific logic to apply the backward scheduling. So I'm using a split block, which is um, already responsible for generating the production orders. So whenever a customer order is stated, then um, it has to proceed to the split block. And the split block makes a copy of the agents which are coming in, in this enter um, block or part of the split block. And then you can specify which um, agent type it should be. So I've generated a production order. So the orders which are generated here in the source are custom orders. And when I generate um, and production orders, they get the type production order. And the main uh, thing which happens in the split block is on the one hand to generate a production order. And on the other hand, I specify already the start date. So that means I'm copying 
the due date from the original agent, which is the custom order. So I save it as well in the production order in the attribute plant due date. And I also calculate already the plant release date. And I save this um, starting date of this production order in the attribute of the production order plant release. And this is already the important part in backward scheduling. So I'm taking the original due date, which is the customer due date, and then I subtract the plant lead time. And then the order knows already when the order has to start and when it has to be finished. So it has to be finished in the plant due date and it has to start at the plant release. And then the next block is a delay block. Basically, the idea is just delay the items, which are the production orders, until their planned release date has been occurred. That means I have set the capacity at maximum capacity and I just delay it um, um, taking the planned start date, which is the planned release, into consideration and I subtract the actual time when the order has reached this enter block. And in some cases, it could be already happening that those orders should have already started in the past. That means I've already backlog. And if that term, the agent.plant release minus the time is negative, then of course I cannot delay it negatively in the delay block. So I just take the zero. That means, okay, I know you are, um, you are too late. Please go immediately to production. When an order is leaving the exit block of the release block, that means those production orders are ready for production. That means I send them to the exit production block so that they can enter production and then production is happening. Once they are finished, I transfer them back to the enter FGI, which is the Q2 of a match block. So I often make use of these match blocks um, most of my models um, have this match block. The first queue of this match block is most likely responsible for storing, storing the custom orders, which have not been satisfied. And the second um, queue is responsible for the FGI, for the finished goods inventory. Now we have already inventory because we finished production and the order is waiting. And on the customer side, customer states the order and is transferred to a delay block. And in this delay block, I just delay the order, the custom order, until their due date has been reached. When the due date is there, then they are going in this Q1 of the match block. And now the match condition is just true. Is an item available? If it is true, then both can leave the queues. If the production or um, if the production order has not been on time, then we get a delay, a tardiness for the customer order until the production is finished, and vice versa as well. So we could have the possibility that uh, we do not need the safety times in the plant lead time. That means. The order is uh, finished earlier and then the order is waiting until the customer order has reached the due date. Um, I'm also then collecting some data. Um, so you can see two statistic elements and um, I've also implemented a warm up time. So therefore I've introduced an event um, which occurs once and after 1000 minutes, which is again the simulation runtime for this model. No, that's not correct. The 1000 minutes are the warm up time. The runtime of the backwards scheduling is in simulation and it's 10,000 minutes. So after 1000 minutes, I'm using the warm-up time and I'm resetting all the statistic elements and I'm also um, so 
there are more statistic elements. So the FGI, the custom order and so on and so forth. I'm resetting all those statistic elements and I've activated in the processing station um, force statistic collection that um, allows me um, that I can make use of the function um, utilization so that I can also monitor the utilization of this processing station. And I make sure um, that after the warm-up time, also the collection of the utilization is resetted. And then we are ready to go. Then you can, of course, extend this model to multi-items. Um, you have to pay attention that you then change the match condition because right now the match condition is just true. But if you introduce multi-items, then of course um, a customer can state product one, and then you have to make sure that also product one is then ready for dispatching to the customer. So you have to change the match condition or you introduce more match blocks. That's up to you. Good luck with modeling.